Hello, everyone, and welcome to the unit Leading and Managing People. My name is Reena, and today we are working to develop an understanding of how employees are led and managed. Now, this unit aims to help you to develop knowledge and understanding of the concepts, principles, and skills that are needed to lead and manage people. During the course of this LO, we will see how effective employee leadership and management are crucial for the overall success of the organization. And there are several theories and approaches to leadership that are shaping these practices. We will also understand how leadership theories such as transformational and transactional leadership, they offer framework for inspiring and directing the employees towards achieving goals. And how management theories like McGregor's Theory X and Theory Y focus on different motivational strategies to motivate the employees. We will also see how different leadership styles, ranging from autocratic leadership to democratic leadership, how these leadership styles, how do they influence how decisions are made and how employees are engaged in the process. And further into this LO, we will also understand what are the key performance indicators and how it is an essential tool for measuring the employee performance so that it is in alignment with the organizational objective. Further, we will also learn addressing employee conflicts through structured conflict resolution strategies and why it is vital for maintaining a harmonious and productive work environment. Now, in this LO, we are going to cover AC 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3. We are going to cover different ways in which employees are led and managed, the key theory of leadership, five management theories, different leadership styles, what are the key performance indicators, conflict management techniques, steps in conflict resolution, etc. Let's take a look at a short video on the same topic for you to familiarize yourself with this concept. Now, before we go ahead with this LO, let us firstly recap the learning of LO1. If you remember, in LO1, we learned that leadership and management, though they are often changed, used interchangeably, but they involve distinct roles and responsibilities within an organization. And both are equally crucial for the organizational success, but they do involve two different sets of skills and qualities. Leadership is all about inspiring and motivating people towards an organizational vision or a goal. One of the major difference between leadership and management is the vision. A leader is someone who sets the vision or the goals and a manager is someone who makes the path to reach those goals with the help of the employees. Leadership uses intrinsic motivators such as recognition, empowerment, personal growth, whereas management, it relies on extrinsic motivators such as rewards, penalties and any form of formal evaluation. Now, leaders proactively, they seek and drive change. And whereas managers, their job is to manage the change within the established framework. Managers, they focus on planning, organizing, and controlling resources, your time, financial resources, uh, human resources to meet the organizational objectives efficiently. They ensure, it's the job of the manager to ensure stability through the formal authority, risk management, and by adhering to the procedures that have been laid down. We also understood the difference between delegation and abdication of responsibility. If you recall, we discussed that delegation involves empowering others with clear responsibility, providing them with authority and support, while maintaining the accountability for the outcome with the delegator himself. Whereas abdication of responsibility involves complete relinquishing the control without providing the necessary support, guidance, or any kind of accountability. This often leads to negative consequences and poor outcomes. Now, let us take a look at the current LO, that is LO2, to understand how employees are led in management. Primarily, employees are led and managed through a combination of various strategies and practices that are designed to inspire, guide, and support them in achieving the organizational goals. Effective leadership drives change 
and it motivates employees. Whereas an effective management, it ensures the structured implementation of tasks and goals, overall creating a balanced organizational environment. If you take a look at this table, it gives example of how employees are led and managed in different aspects, such as change management, conflict resolution, performance ma monitoring, risk management. Let us uh, drill down into them one by one. Now, leadership is vision-oriented, focusing on inspiring and guiding people towards a shared future goal. Leaders typically, they use motivational techniques to create a sense of purpose and direction. For example, a CEO, maybe his vision is for a company expansion into the global markets. And he might articulate this vision to the employees in the process, inspiring them to innovate and collaborate towards achieving the international presence. Now, if you look at the management approach, management approach is task oriented. They emphasize on the efficient execution of the processes and achievement of specific objectives. They are very focused towards the task. Managers, they ensure that daily operations align with the broader goal that is set by the leadership. Let's try to understand with an example. For example, a project manager, he is tasked with developing a new product. So what he will do is that he will break down the entire vision of the leader into certain actionable steps. That in step one, I have to do this. In step two, I have to do this. Step three, I have to do this. And then they assign responsibilities to the right people. They monitor the progress. And in the process, if there are any issues that are arising, they try to address those issues to ensure that the project is completed on time within the budget. Let's look at another aspect of motivation. Now, in case of a motivational leadership approach, it is focused on inspiring and empowering the employees to achieve their best with a complete focus on the shared vision and in the process encouraging personal growth. Leaders usually use this approach to prioritize the emotional intelligence and at times team cohesion. For this, they use intrinsic motivators. Now, for example, a leader, what he might do is that he might organize regular team building activities and they may provide opportunities for professional development to create a motivated and engaged workforce. The same uh, concept, if you look from a management approach, it emphasizes on planning, organizing and controlling the tasks to achieve specific goals. Managers, they are using this approach to prioritize a clear structure, clear process by using the extrinsic motivators. For example, say a manager, he might implement a detailed project timeline with specific milestones and he may use performance metrics to ensure that the tasks are completed on time and within the budget. Now, if you come to the communication aspect in a leadership approach, it emphasizes on inspiring, motivating, and guiding the people through the use of effective communication. They are trying to create a collaborative and in inclusive environment. And leaders are using, using this approach to focus on building relationships, listening to their team members, and encouraging an open dialogue. For example, uh, say there's a leader in a tech startup, he might hold regular team meetings where he's sharing the company's vision, he's listening to the feedback and adjusting the strategies based on the collective input. In contrast to this, in a management approach, they're more concerned with organizing, planning and execution of the tasks to achieve specific objectives. Managers often focus on settling goals, monitoring progress, and at the time, ensuring that the team members are following the processes and sticking to the deadlines. Now, for instance, if a manager uh, in a manufacturing plant, he may develop detailed schedules, assigning tasks to the workers, closely monitoring the production matrix to ensure that they are meeting the quarterly targets. When it comes to the aspect of decision making, leadership approach is focused on vision inspiration and long-term goals. Leaders 
they make decisions that are aligning with the broader mission and they motivate their team towards the shared objective. Now, for example, if there's a leader at a tech startup, he, may, he might decide to invest in an innovative but a risky new project. But he believes in the project and he believes that it will set his company apart from the competitors and may drive the future growth. Now, in contrast, the management approach emphasizes on the process and immediate results. So manager makes decision based on optimization of the resources at the same time, meeting the, maintaining the stability and meeting short-term targets. Now the same manager in the uh, same tech startup, uh, the example that we have taken, he might choose to allocate resources to improve the current product performance. It he, uh, The job of the manager is to ensure that it is meeting their quarterly sales goal and the customer satis uh, customers are satisfied. Both the approaches are crucial because the leader approach is more progressive. It is leading the business into the new domain. So both approaches are crucial. Leadership decisions are driving that uh, change and they are inspiring, whereas management decisions are ensuring the smooth operations and focused on achieving the immediate objectives. Leadership and management, though they are interconnected, the emphasis is on different aspects of guiding the organization. Leadership is more focused on inspiring and motivating employees towards the shared vision. And in the process, encouraging innovation and personal growth. For example, a leader might support a team member by providing the mentorship and creating a culture where the ideas are freely discussed, they are explored, and the ideas are actually valued. And on the other hand, management is completely centered on overseeing the operational task. It is like a tunnel vision, which is ensuring efficiency and meeting the organizational goals. A manager might develop clear processes. A manager might set performance targets and ensure that the resources are allocated. For example, a manager in a tech company might streamline the project workflow, providing the deadlines when the project is supposed to be delivered. Now, coming to the concept of uh, aspect of conflict resolution. Conflict resolution can be approached differently depending on whether it's a leadership approach or a management perspective. Now, in a leadership approach, leaders focus on inspiring and guiding their teams through the conflict. Their priority lies in understanding the underlying issues. And then they kind of uh, encourage open communication. And through open communication, they build the trust. The leaders aim to address the conflict by promoting collaboration and maybe finding a solution that is mutually beneficial for all. For example, a leader might you know, facilitate a team building retreat to address ongoing tensions among the team members, encouraging the team members to express their concerns openly, and then working along with the team to develop a shared vision. But if same conflict resolution is looked at from the management approach, the managers often take a structured and procedural approach to conflict resolution. They will focus on implementing policies and following the protocols, ensuring there is a compliance within, uh, within the organization with the organizational standards. Their entire aim is to resolve the conflicts efficiently, maybe by mediating the dispute, maybe by making decisions to maintain the productivity. So for example, if it's a management approach, a manager might hold a formal mediation session to address the conflict. He might act as a mediator between two employees within the broad framework of the company policy to reach a resolution that is in line with the organizational goals and guidelines. Again, change management. Now, what is change management? Change management basically involves guiding the organization through transitions or period of transformation. Leadership approach to change management is completely focused on inspiring and motivating employees because everybody, when the new change is coming in, Everybody is a little flustered. They don't know what is their future, whether their jobs are going to stay there or are they going to be laid off. So there is a period of uncertainty. In these times, the leadership, he tries to focus on inspiring and motivating the employees and it's continuously telling the employees, sharing with the employees the vision of the organization and encouraging innovation 
and adaptability. Adaptability is super important in time of change management because you have to be open-minded and be more acceptable of the changes that are coming to your way. So you have to be more flexible. You have to be more adaptable. Leaders, they emphasize on the human aspect through clear communication and they empathize with the, with the team or the feeling of frustration of not getting that clarity, what is their you know, future in the organization. So leaders empathize. For example, during a company-wide shift to a remote working concept, a leader might hold regular virtual meetings to address any kind of a concerns or maybe just to celebrate smaller wins or providing some kind of a support. But the management approach is more structured. And as we've discussed many times, that the management approach is always process-oriented, more to do with planning, organizing, and controlling. Controlling of the resources. Managers, what they're typically doing is that they're developing detailed plans with clear objectives and they're monitoring the process to ensure that the change is being implemented effectively. It is being implemented in a stepwise manner. So if you take the same example of the remote working scenario, in this case, the manager might create a step-by-step -step plan for the transition and in including technology implementation, the training schedules and performance metrics to track the productivity. Now, for a performance monitoring aspect, leadership approach is focused on, again, inspiration and motivation of the employees to achieve their best by providing them the broader organizational vision, guidance and support to reach that organizational vision. Leaders, their emphasis on building the trust, recognizing individual contribution and overall creating a organizational environment where innovation is encouraged or supported and collaboration is celebrated. For example, a leader might hold a regular one-on-one -on -one meeting with the team members to discuss their career aspirations and then providing mentorship so that their personal goals are at all times aligned with the organizational objectives. Any organization success is dependent on the team. And the team's personal uh, success is dependent on the organization. So it is the job of the leader to ensure, to discuss the career aspirations of the, the team and then providing them with the pathways wherein their personal goals are aligned with the organizational goals. Now, in contrast, a management approach to performance monitoring is more like a task-oriented, just concentrating on setting the goals, then monitoring the progress and ensuring that the process is being adhered to and standards are being followed. So they prioritize their entire, the manager's priority is efficiency, meeting the deadlines, maintaining the consistency in achievement of the targets. For example, a ma manager might use performance metrics and regularly review the track to track the employee progress against predefined targets. And if there are any deviations, then immediately they are addressed by, so that the entire project is on track. Now, if you see at the risk management approach, it emphasizes on creating a proactive culture, which is focused on identifying, assessing, and mitigation of that risk through strategic guidance and a shared sense of responsibility. For example, a CEO who champions risk management might, might, might itself initiate risk assessment and encourages open communication with the team about the potential threats. So in this way, what, it, what the leader is doing is that the leader is integrating the risk management into the overall strategic planning. Whereas a management approach to the risk, it completely focuses on implementing specific procedures and controls to handle an instance of a risk. For example, a risk manager might develop detailed protocol for data security breaches, ensuring that the employees are following the established procedures to mitigate the risk. Now, both approaches are essential for balance and effective organization. You have to combine the visionary and the motivational aspect of leadership with the pragmatic, the practical and the systematic nature of the management. And then only the organization, the overall organizational um, uh, vision or the goal can be achieved. Okay, now let's take a look at AC 
Now, what is HC 2.1 is requiring us to do is that it requires you to outline key management and leadership theories. Okay, management theories, um, they kind of provide a framework for understanding and improving the organizational effectiveness. Some of the prominent management theories are uh, scientific management theory propounded by Frederick Taylor. And scientific management theory focuses on improving efficiency through standardization and optimizing of the workflow. Taylor advocated for a systematic approach to increase productivity by analyzing tasks and using scientific methods to determine the best way to perform them. Another management theory is a administrative management theory that was propounded by Henry Fayol. Now, administrative management theory emphasizes the principle of management and the importance of the organizational structure. Fayol introduced key functions of management that is planning, organizing, leading, controlling, and he he was, a, he was the biggest advocate for a clear hierarchy and division of labor. Next is your human relations theory propounded by Elton Mayo. Now, human relations theory highlights the importance of human factors in productivity. If you see Mayo's study, notably the Hawthorne experiments, it reveals that worker satisfaction and motivation, it significantly impacts the performance. If your worker is dissatisfied or demotivated, obviously you will see an impact on the overall productivity. So a worker satisfaction and motivation leads to a greater focus on employee needs and interpersonal relationships. Next, we have a behavioral management theory, which was propounded by Douglas McGregor. He introduced theories X and theories Y, theory X and Y, which describes different attitudes towards employee motivation. Theory X assumes that employees are inherently lazy and they require continuous micromanagement, strict supervision, whereas Theory Y assumes employees are self-motivated and they seek responsibility. Next, we have Contingency Theory by Fred Fiedler. Contingency Theory suggests that the most effective management style depends on the context and situational factors. The contingency theory suggests that there is no one size fits all approach to management. But the best approach depends upon the different circumstances in which that organization is in. Now, next we have the systems theory. Now, systems theory view organizations as complex systems which have interrelated parts. This theory emphasizes the importance of understanding the different components of an organization, how these different components of an organization are interacting and how the external factors are influencing the organizational performance. Maybe the technological factors, the political factors, maybe the, you know, the overall environmental factors, how different external factors are influencing the organizational performance. And next we have different leadership theories. They offer different perspective on how leadership is achieved. So starting with the transformational leadership. Now transformational leadership, it focused completely on inspiring and motivating the followers to exceed their own self-interest for the overall good of the organizational. The transformational leaders, they are known for their vision, charisma, and their ability to foster innovation and change. Transactional leadership is centered on the exchange process between leader and follower. Leaders, they offer rewards or punishment based on the performance. And this theory emphasizes uh, structured tasks and clearer roles so that the organizational goals can be achieved. Then we have servant leadership. What the servant leadership does is that it prioritizes the need of the followers, the need of the team members, and it seeks to empower them uplift them. Servant leadership focused on is focused on serving the team, fostering the trust and encouraging personal and professional growth. Next, we have situational leadership. Now, situational leadership suggests that no single leadership style is best. Effective leadership is depending on the situations and the readiness of the followers. So it is the job of the leader to adapt their style 
based on the task and the maturity of the team. Then we have authentic leadership, which emphasizes on the importance of the leaders being true to themselves and their values. The authentic leaders are more self-aware, they are transparent, they are ethical, and they, they, they support, trust, and you know, genuine relationship with their followers. The charismatic leaders leadership relies on the personal charm and appeal of the leader. Sometimes the you know leaders are charismatic. People like to follow them. The they charm or they they you know they lead the people through enthusiasm and commitment through their magnetic personality and a very compelling vision. Now each of these theories it offer a different insight into the nature of leadership and different approaches different styles of the leaders through which an organization is able to achieve its objective. If you take a look at this, you may find there may be some replication of the discussion that we have covered above in the leadership theories. But here we are going to dive deeper into list of different leadership styles. And I'll in the process, I will try to give you certain examples for you to you know, uh, understand it better and to maybe just to uh, fit in like a jigsaw puzzle, which particular leadership is more popular in which circumstance. Now, let's start with the autocratic leadership. Now, autocratic leadership, the leaders make decisions unilaterally, you know, autocratic. They are, they are going to, they are the ones who are going to lay down the rules. There is no team involvement without much input from the team members. They are making the decisions unilaterally. And this, this, this style is mostly characterized by individual control over all the decisions with little or no delegation. For example, Steve Jobs at Apple, he was known for his autocratic leadership style, making key decisions himself and expecting high standards from his team. Then you have democratic leadership, which is also known as a participative leadership. Here, the leaders involve the team members in decision-making process. Leader, even though they make the final decision, the input received from the team members or from the group of, uh, you know, team, it is valued and it is encouraged. Google is a well-known, um, Google's leadership approach is well-known for their participative leadership because they, they encourage a culture where the employees are encouraged to give their input and for the collaboration. Next, we have transformational leadership. As we discussed above, in transformational leadership, the leader is inspiring and motivating the team to achieve some extraordinary outcomes by focusing on the greater good and fostering a shared vision. For example, Nelson Mandela's leadership in South Africa. It is an example of transformational leadership where he has a vision of uh, peace and equality and he pursued the peace and equality as a, as a vision and he inspired an entire nation to follow that path. Next, we have transactional leadership. Now, leaders in transactional leadership, the leaders are focused on supervision, organization, and performance. And they use rewards and punishments, like a carrot and a stick theory, using the rewards and punishment to motivate their teams. Mostly the military leadership, often they are used as an example for transactional leadership, where clear rules, discipline, and reward for compliance are emphasized. Next, we have laser sphere leadership. Here, the leaders take a hands-off approach, giving the team members a high degree of autonomy to make the decisions and manage their own work. Warren Buffet, the CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, is known for his laser sphere leadership style. He allows the managers and he calls their his, his managers as his team members who are running the companies, their own companies, with minimal interference from his side. The servant leadership is another kind of a leadership and the style of leadership where the leaders, they are prioritizing serving their team members, focusing on their growth, well-being and development. And then it's kind of a creating a strong sense of community. Maybe Mother Teresa's leadership can be quoted as an example of a servant leadership because she devoted her entire life towards serving others. Then we have situational leadership where the leaders are adapting their style based on the situation and the readiness of their followers. The approach differentiates between direct giving them direction or coaching or support or delegating depending upon the need of the team. For example, a project manager, he may adopt a more 
you know, directional or directive style with a new team because they are not that much experienced and they need more help with uh, providing them clear direction. But he may switch to a more delegative style where he's able to give the he's able to delegate the job to the team because the team has become experienced over a certain period of time. Then we have charismatic leadership where leaders inspire and attract followers through their charm, persuasion, and communication skills. The charismatic leaders often they have a very strong vision and you know, they have the ability to energize and motivate their team. For example, Ma Martin Luther King Jr. he demonstrated charismatic leadership using this. Yeah, he was a very powerful orator and uh, he has this vision for the civil rights. So with his oratory skills and his vision, he was able to inspire millions of people. Next, we have a bureaucratic leadership where leaders focus on following the rules, procedures and established processes. Now, this is mostly common in highly regulated environments where the consistency and adherence to standards is crucial. Most of the leaders in the government agencies, they often exhibit bureaucratic leadership. So they ensure that all the operations are, you know, having a tunnel vision, adhering to the strict policies and regulations. And next we have visionary leadership. Now, uh, visionary leader is, you know, somebody who's more focused on uh, creating and communicating a long-term vision for the organization. They inspire the team to work towards this vision with enthusiasm. Elon Musk's leadership at Tesla and SpaceX is often seen as a visionary leadership because he has uh, he, he has his, this broader vision and these ambitious goals for electrical vehicles and you know space exploration, which is at the heart of the innovation. Next, we have pace setting leadership where leaders are setting high standards and they're leading by example. And at the same time, they're expecting their team also to perform at the same high level. It may drive fast result, but it may also lead to burnout because two people are not, you know, at the same standard. Everybody is not uh, so crazy about or so focused about the particular vision. So Jeff Bezos, during the earlier years of Amazon, he exhibited pace setting leadership wherein he was driving his team very, very hard to meet the demanding perform and demanding the, uh, to meet the demanding uh, performance targets. And then we have coaching leadership where the leaders are focused on developing the individual team members by helping them build their skills and improve their performance. And this requires a lot of guidance, a lot of mentoring and coaching. Uh, an example is of Phil Jackson, who is a former coach of Chicago Bulls and LA Lakers. He's known for his coaching leadership style, which was focused on personal and the professional growth of his players. Now, this uh, these different leadership styles can be applied in different contexts. And an effective leader is someone who, who is able to blend the different elements of multiple styles depending upon the need of the team and the overall organization. So this is all about the leadership styles. Coming to AC 2.2, this requires you to outline the key performance indicators that is used by the employers. Firstly, we are going to understand what is key performance, a key employee performance indicators. Now, KPIs are basically measurable values which are used to evaluate an employee effectiveness and contributions to an organization. They the KPIs provide insight into how well an employee is performing their role relative to the organizational goals and objectives. See, at the end of the day, an employee is getting paid. They have to be able to deliver something. That deliverable should be compared relative to what is the organizational goal. So KPIs can vary depending on the role, depending upon the industry. But typically, most of the key KPIs include metrics such as productivity, quality of work, adherence to deadlines, customer satisfaction, collaboration. For example, a sales representative. For him, a KPI is sales revenue, number of a new clients acquired, or the customer retention rate. These indicators, the job of these indicators is to help the organization track progress, identify key areas for improvement, and make informed decision about employee development and compensation. Let's take a look at the key APIs which are used by the employers typically. 
This includes productivity, which measures the amount of work that is completed by the employee relative to the expectations or the targets, such as number of tasks that are completed, the sales volume or the product, uh, the project that is managed. Next is the quality of work, which assesses the accuracy, thoroughness and overall quality of the employee's output, including the error rates, adherence to standards and the client's satisfaction. Next KPI is attendance and punctuality, which tracks the reliability of the employee in terms of attendance and timeliness, including the frequency of absence or the frequency of lateness. Next we, next we have is the goal achievement, wherein the goal achievement evaluates the progress towards specific predefined objectives or milestones, which reflects the employee's ability to either meet or exceed the performance goals. Next, we have customer or the client feedback, which measures the satisfaction or the feedback from the client or customers reflecting the employee's effectiveness in delivering the, the, the value or the service or the product. Depends completely on the client or the customer feedback. Next, we have collaboration and teamwork, which measures the employee's ability to work effectively with others, including you know, how the employee is setting well in a team and this uh, in terms of the communication, cooperation and support for the team goals. Then we have innovation and initiative wherein we are assessing the employees' creativity, their problem solving skills or their willingness to take on new challenges or maybe propose some improvements. Now sales performance for roles that are involving sales, this KPI will track metrics such as sales volume, revenue generated, conversion rates, new client acquisition, Efficiency metric assesses how effectively an employee utilizes the resources, whether in terms of time, material, to achieve the particular desired outcome. Then training and development tracks an employee's commitment to learning and professional growth, including participation in training sessions and acquiring new skills. Then we have compliance and adherence, which monitors how an employee is adhering to the company policies, procedures, and the regulatory requirements, whether the employees are following the established organizational guidelines and standards or not. We have problem solving skills, which evaluates an employee's ability to identify the issue, analyze the situation, and at the same time, develop effective solutions. Dependability measures the reliability of an employee in terms of meeting deadlines maintaining consistent performance. Then we have leadership and initiative. For managerial roles, you have to assess their ability to lead the team, making the decisions and taking initiative in driving the project. Then we have employee engagement KPI, which measures the level of an employee engagement and commitment to their work through engagement surveys and feedback. Now these KPIs, they help employers evaluate and manage the employee performance by providing insight into the areas of strength as well as opportunities for any future development. Now we come to the AC 2.3 that requires us to explain how employee conflicts can be managed. Obviously, if you are working in a setup, you are bound to have some situations where there may be some conflict. So employee conflict basically refer to any kind of a disagreement or dispute between employees in a workplace. There may be various sources of these conflicts, such as maybe difference in values, difference in goals, opinions, competition for the same set of resources, maybe personality clashes, or just a communication breakdown. For example, if two team members, they disagree on how to approach a project, this could lead to a tension and reduced collaboration and a negative impact on overall team morale. Now, addressing this employee conflict effectively involves understanding the root cause and you know, supporting or encouraging an open communication and at the same time, seeking uh, mutually acceptable solutions so that there is an overall positive and a productive work environment. Now, managing employee conflicts effectively involves addressing the issues promptly. There are few strategies. For example, um, active listening. 
you have to encourage employee to express their concerns openly and listen to all the parties involved. If two members are arguing over a project responsibility, arrange a meeting with, with where each person can voice their perspective. You have to, as a manager, you have to show empathy. You have to understand and help them feel heard and valued. Sometimes, you know, the manager has to act as a neutral party to facilitate a resolution. And there you have to mediate between two employees who are having a disagreement, say, about a shared task. So you can, as a manager, you can, or a leader, you can mediate a discussion where they are collaboratively exploring solutions, how to move forward. Then you have to clarify the expectation. Now ensure that the roles, responsibilities, and expectations are clearly defined at the beginning of the task itself. If, for example, if you are not able to do that, it may lead to any conflict arising from overlapping duties or in that case, you have to revisit the job description and the project, the scoping of the project to clarify and adjust the responsibility. You have to provide them with the conflict resolution training. You have to train your employees to develop their conflict resolution skills. You have to offer workshops on negotiation and communication techniques so the team members are able to manage disputes independently. And Ultimately, you have to create a positive work environment. You have to create a, you know, a, an environment, a work environment, which is supportive and respectful work and workplace culture. You have to implement team building activities that encourages collaboration and it reduces the likelihood of conflicts. If you combine all these approaches, then you can address the conflicts constructively and maintain a harmonious work environment. Let's take a look at you know, several steps to address and resolve the issues. It's a more structured approach here. We start with identifying the issue. You have to understand the nature and the root cause of the conflict. This involves gathering information from all the parties involved and then getting a clear picture of the situation. Then you have to assess the impact. You have to evaluate how the conflict is affecting the team dynamics, productivity and overall workplace morale. This will help you in understanding the uh, urgency and the scale of intervention that is needed. Once you have assessed the impact, you will be able to you know, be in a position where you can determine should you wait for some more days for, this, for them to resolve it in, uh, within themselves or the scale of intervention is, is urgent and it is the, you need an immediate resolution right now. Then you have to engage in open communication. You have to facilitate a meeting where all the parties can express their perspective. There is an active listening and everybody should be given an opportunity to voice their concerns without any interruptions. Next step is to explore the solution. Now you have to collectively brainstorm potential solutions. You have to encourage all parties. See, you can't be, you can't just bring a problem. If there is a problem, you should be able to contribute with ideas. You know, you have to find a solution to, uh, in a collaborative setup. You have to contribute to ideas. You have to work together to find a mutually acceptable. It should be mutually acceptable to uh, all that kind of a resolution. Then you have to develop an action plan. You have to create. You have to create a plan which is um, which should include specific steps to resolve the issue. You have to assign the responsibilities and you have to set the deadline for follow-up. Next, you need to implement the solution. Ultimately, you have to put the plan into the practice and you have to ensure that all the parties are aware of their roles and responsibilities in the resolution process. Ultimately, you have to uh, monitor the progress. Regularly, you have to check in to assess the effectiveness of the solution, whether that solution is actually working also or not. And if you, if it is not working, then you have to make adjustments, whichever is necessary. This will ultimately ensure that the conflict remains resolved and there are no future issues to hamper the productivity. Provide feedback and support. Provide constructive feedback, ongoing support to the involved parties and encourage continuous improvement in the employees in, the, in their communication and in the conflict resolution skills. If you're following these steps, one can effectively manage and resolve conflict, leading to a more positive and a productive work environment. 
Now let's take a look at different types of conflicts and I will give an example of the possible resolution for that conflict. We'll start with interpersonal conflict. Now interpersonal con conflict as the name suggests is a conflict between individuals due to personal differences or understandings or maybe they have an uh, incompatible personalities. Let's take an example of two co-workers, Mr. A and Mr. J. They disagree on how to approach a project. Mr. A prefers more detailed step-by-step -step plan, where Mr. J is more spontaneous, more creative. Now, what is going to be the resolution for this? Our resolution is mediation. Maybe a manager or a neutral third party could facilitate a discussion to help both the parties, Mr. A and Mr. J, to understand each other's perspective, identify common ground, and then agree on a balanced approach. Sometimes we may have intrapersonal conflict. Intrapersonal conflicts are like internal conflict within an individual, which is often involving a struggle between different needs, desires, or different values. So, for example, uh, Miss E, she is offered a promotion that requires relocating to a new city. But she is conflicted because she doesn't want to leave her family and her friends. She has an established life here and she is She's in a confused state of mind. Here, the resolution will be self-reflection on part of the employee and counseling. She may benefit from weighing the pros and cons of the move, seeking advice from a mentor or working with a counselor, counselor to make a decision that aligns with her long-term goals. Sometimes you may have intra-group conflict. An intra-group conflict is a conflict within a group or team, which, which is often arising from differences in opinions or work styles among different group members. For example, there's a project team in a marketing firm that is disagreeing on the direction of the campaign. Some members want to target a younger audience. Others believe the focus should be more established demographic. In this case, you have to be you have to resolve this conflict through a collaborative problem solving. The team will be asked to hold a brainstorming session to explore all options. They should be This should be followed by a voting process or a consensus building activity. And then they should agree on a direction that incorporate elements from the both perspectives. There may be intergroup conflicts, where the conflict is between two different teams or two different groups, maybe due to competition or maybe the organization silos are such. For example, the sales and the customer service department of a company, they may clash because the sales team, it is prioritizing the uh, closing of the closure of the sales deal, whereas the customer service team is more focused on the long-term client satisfaction. Here again, collaboration is the way. You have to call for an intergroup collaboration. You have to create cross-functional teams. That means some people from the sales team, some people from the customer uh, care team, they should come together and they should hold the regular meeting to align the goals and priorities of the both groups, thereby reducing the misunderstandings and overall fostering cooperation. There may be organizational conflict where there's a conflict within an organization, often which is arising from the structural issues. Maybe the resource allocation, different department is holding, uh, having a priority. For example, a company's IT department and marketing department, they are disagreeing on a budget allocation. IT needs more fund for system upgrade. Marketing wants more fund for new campaigns. Here, the resolution is negotiation and compromise. The department's could negotiate a compromise, possibly maybe reallocating resources or finding a way to share the budget for overall benefit. Sometimes there may be role conflict where a conflict is arising when an individual faces incompatible demands or expectations, which is related to their role. And obviously it will lead to more stress or confusion. Now, for example, Mr. S is a team leader who is expected to be both manager manage the uh, manage the uh, the team's workload and then contribute as an individual contributor also so the person is being expected to manage the as a part of the team manage the team workload and at the same time contribute to the project as an individual contributor there is bound to be conflict on time management now how we are going to resolve this is by prioritization the employee could seek clarification from the manager regarding the role expectations and priorities and possibly negotiating a more defined role and or some additional support. 
again there may be task conflict where the conflicts related to the content and goal of the work such as disagreements over how tasks should be performed or what the end goals should be now there are two engineers on a product development team and they are disagreeing on the best design approach for a new product feature again here the resolution is has to be a constructive debate and expert consultation you have to encourage a constructive debate where each engineer present their case possibly following followed by consulting with an external expert this will lead to a more informed decision everybody will know after this debate and after this expert consultation where exactly are they they are standing sometimes there may be process conflict whereas a conflict is about how task should be accomplished including disagreement uh, over the procedures the responsibilities and the workflow for example a team disagrees on the workflow for a new software implementation and some members they are wait they they want to follow a more uh, traditional waterfall approach and others are more advocate for an agile methodology here again the resolution is more on the basis of process mapping consensus they may map out the pros and cons of each approach combine the elements so at the end you have to combine the elements from both to create a hybrid workflow to meet the need of all team members there may be value conflict there may be conflict arising from different values the ethics or the you know um, beliefs are maybe different and this may be deeply personal which may be difficult to reconcile for example say a team member refuses to work on a project that promotes a product that is maybe harmful to the environment whereas the other person on the team sees it just another business opportunity now here uh, it's more like the resolution is more on the basis of value based dialogue and ethical decision making the teams could engage in a dialogue to understand each other's value possibly seeking an alternative project that aligns with the concerned team members ethical stance or finding a way to mitigate the environmental impact then there may be cultural conflicts sometimes the conflicts are resulting from differences in cultural backgrounds or the communication styles which may be often seen in a diverse team or in in case of global organizations for example there is a global team they experience tension because the team members are from different cultural backgrounds having different expectations about the etiquettes and communication styles here the only resolution is cultural sensitivity training and open communication that teams should be encouraged to participate in cultural sensitivity training to understand each other's background and to understand each other uh, culture in a better way so that they can establish the ground rules for communication that respect everyone's cultural norms see conflict resolution typically it involves or it resolves with the on the basis of open communication empathy and an inherent willingness to find a common ground the approach may be depending on the type and context of the conflict but there has to be a willingness inside to find a common ground so now this uh, brings us to the end of lo2 i hope you have been able to follow through with the discussion just to summarize what we have discussed in lo2 we learned that employees are led and managed through a blend of leadership and management theories styles and practical strategies leadership theories such as transformational leadership emphasizes on inspiring and motivating employees towards a shared vision while transactional leadership focuses on performance based rewards and penalties we have uh, seen management theories like scientific management and administrative management which emphasizes on structured process and efficiency we have seen leadership styles like democratic autocratic which influence how decisions are made and how team members are engaged we discussed about the key performance indicators how it is used to uh, you know measure the employee performance and align their efforts with organizational goals and we also learned how to manage the employee conflicts by identifying the issue assessing its impact engaging in open communication exploring solutions developing an action plan and ultimately providing the feedback and support this overall comprehensive approach ensures that the employees are effectively guided and supported to achieve both their individual success and organizational success so this brings us to the conclusion of this session 
if you have any queries regarding this cello, you can always reach out to us at learnerwork at ukversity.co.uk. Thank you very much.